Good morning, everyone. <coughs> I'm Alexander, and today I'll tell you about how to vote. And um, so the general plan for today is to have a mix of both, like the theoretical and applied, uh, so to say. So we'll talk about both what how to vote is, how it works, uh, what, what what design choices we have to make when developing the systems, and we also have a few hands-on sessions uh, actually trying to use how to vote for different problems uh, with demo classification and time series forecasting. Uh, this is just a rough plan. Uh, but we might adjust it on, on the go. And one thing that I also want to say, like, if you have any questions along the way, you can also like, raise your hand and feel free to ask them. Uh, so no need to wait until the end of the q and I'm happy to take the questions as they come. <clears throat> and the first thing that I want to ask you to do uh, is to uh, go to both of those links. They will lead to Kotlin notebooks. And now you have to play the, the first cell. Uh, which will do a quick install of Autobahn. This will take like maybe like three minutes, uh, but we can do it right now so that we don't like we save time when it comes to the actual hands on sessions. And I will do the same right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's like this is like this is what the notebook would look like. And there in the first cell, it says pip install. And I click play here, and installation starts. And then I'll do the same for. The second notebook. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, just, just a second. Uh, so these are the links. Let's give a couple of seconds to make sure this works for everyone. Does it? Probably let the Excuse me? You don't mind following the note? Do you have to follow the note? Um, and at least with, like, with the auto implementation, usually just works uh, out of the box. I don't, if, if, if it doesn't work and you need to clone it, then let me know. I will do a update the instruction. So let's have a look here. See if the installation is running. And this is the kind of output you should see. Uh, okay, so I hope everyone had time to copy the links, and now we can get to the actual. <clears throat> time to the presentation. Uh, so first of all, you know, there's a very short recap. What is machine learning? <clears throat> and usually this whole process consists of several three steps. And uh, we have some data that you want to analyze. This data can be tabular data, like maybe some different numerical, categorical attributes. It can also be something more complicated, uh, but actually images or text. And um, with this data, we want to build some uh, models. We might want to do some feature engineering, some pre-processing. And finally, you want to make the predictions uh, using these machine learning models that we there. And the goal of Autobahn is to completely automate this process of everything that happens in the second cell in here. So essentially, no matter what data you have, no matter what machine learning problem you have, all you have to do is just bring your data, and then Autobahn will take care of everything else, such as feature engineering, processing, data cleaning, and then you can just use the trained predictor from Autobahn to make the predictions. Um, so in general, the idea is to make like it's an RML toolkit, and I think everybody here knows at this point what RML is. The idea is to democratize machine learning to make it as easy as possible for anyone, no matter their background, to do machine learning on the data that they have and solve the problems that they're dealing with. Um, and uh, the whole like idea of Autobahn is to make it um, very uh, small and minimalistic API where with a single line of code we can build. Uh, accurate machine learning models for images, text, time series, and tabular data. And the idea would be to, like, with this, this single line of code, we want to get results that are as uh, good as what, you know, like a typical data scientist would do, maybe like in you know, like a few days of uh, manual working for the data. It's also open source. You can have a look at it on GitHub. You can just install it on your own laptop. Um, so it's really like an open source system. And yeah, you can have a look at it if you want. Um, it's very it's actively used inside of Amazon. So there are like a course called Machine Learning University that where like every software engineer that joins Amazon uh, takes, and yeah, every year uh, fifteen thousand people take this course, and there they learn how to use Autobahn, and they also deploy it in many systems within Amazon. So it's uh, used both by some products that Amazon uh, has, such as SageMaker, Autopilot, and Canvas, and also internally with many teams that have to do machine learning, maybe classifying products or for all sorts of machine learning tasks uh, um, happening within Amazon. And it's also adopted by many external companies such as Intel, NVIDIA, IBM, Capcom, and Mitsubishi. And like I said, it's completely open source, so everything is on GitHub. Uh, you can have a look at the code if you want to like, 
have a, make a deep dive of how this actually works in practice. Uh, you can also, like, if you something doesn't work for you, you can open an issue, or if you have some ideas of what to do, you can either open like again, an issue with some recommendation, or you can send a pull request. So, um, it's typical with software, uh, with open source software. Um, and let's like briefly talk about how Automall actually works and like what is the principle uh, of the system. So typically, when we hear the word AutoML, we usually think of um, the so-called cache problem, where essentially we have some model and we want to find the optimal hyperparameters for it. And what we do is we take a single model, maybe several models, we and then we try different configurations for these models to find the optimal set of hyperparameters. Um, Autoball takes a different path where it doesn't really rely on hyperparameter optimization as much. And the main like idea is to take things that are within Kaggle competitions and like package them into a nice, easy to use library. And these things include data preprocessing, where like automatically handling different kinds of uh, features. So you know the missing data, uh, doing some data data transformations that um, allow us to that uh, are useful for some machine learning algorithms. Um, there is a big emphasis on deep learning techniques, uh, so neural networks, uh, both for tabular data and for also images and multimodal data such as text. And there are also lots of pre-customizations. So these models are like it's not just like vanilla implementations of these models like YGBM or CatBoost from the respective libraries, but actually also lots of optimization like about like handling different edge cases, like making sure there is enough memory to train the models, uh, making sure that uh, like adding things like early stopping and like in general, like having sensible defaults for all the parameters where like the defaults in the library might not be there. So it's a whole, whole lot of these different tricks. And the main like secret component that makes everything work mm -hmm. uh, is the multi-layer stack assembly uh, used extensively in Audible and Tabular. And we'll cover that in a few uh, slides. But the idea essentially like, is instead of uh, just like traditional AutoML systems, you should just take a few models and then find the best type of parameters for them. For Audible, the like one way, like, a one sentence summary would be, uh, Audible trains many diverse models and then learns to ensemble them uh, and builds the, the best model as an ensemble of many simple models. Uh, and this in practice leads to quite nice results, uh, even though it's not a standard AutoML pipeline. So the short recap, hyperparameter tuning is something that we have all heard about. And the idea is essentially we have some knobs. So we have some algorithm, maybe some neural network algorithm. And then we have some knobs to turn, such as what is the learning rate? What is the number of hidden units in, in the layer? What activation functions we use? These are all the different things that we change these algorithms. And the idea of hyperparameter tuning is to find the best combination of these parameters that leads to the most accurate performance um, on our data. So typical, the typical workflow is we define some model, we define some function that takes the hyperparameters, then it trains the models, and then we keep, um, like we train it multiple times to find the best possible uh, configuration. There are many different strategies, like from something very simple, such as grid search, uh, or random search to more sophisticated ones, such as data optimization, uh, what we learned about already uh, yesterday. And so, and of course the benefits are like, it allows us if you have a single model and if you really want to use this model, this is the way to go. We have to tune this model to get the best possible performance. Uh, but hyperparameter tuning also has some disadvantages that are, we sometimes don't talk about. So the first one, of course, we have to train the model many times. And if training model once is very expensive, then we have to spend a lot of time retraining different configurations. And usually for all these techniques, it's just like not like one, two, three, five times to train the model. It can be, you know, tens or hundreds of model evaluations, which can be quite expensive. And um, also in the end, like after we train all these models, usually we just select the single best model, which has the best type of parameters. And we don't really, like all the other models that we train, like of course we use them to figure out which hyperparameters are good, but they kind of throw them away and not really used for the final prediction. So it feels a bit wasteful that we are not using all those results. Um, and yeah, and the other aspect that is that also important, like difficult to deal with is overfitting because um, the way we usually measure the quality of some model is using, is by looking at its performance either on some holdout data set or maybe by doing cross-validation. But if we, let's say we have like five folds cross-validation, still up to be trained hundreds of model configurations, we well, may end up with something that really overfits to these five specific folds and doesn't necessarily generalize to new data. So there's like this kind of a danger of potential overfitting to the validation data. And also when we do HPL, we don't really think about ensembling as much. We are just, uh, you know, finding the single best model and we don't know how this model will play with maybe other models that we have uh, if you want to somehow combine their predictions. Um, so 
Like as I was alluding to, like the maybe like one idea instead of doing HPO is to look at like a different set of techniques uh, for like if we have multiple models with different configurations, instead of just picking one single best model which with the best hyperparameters, we can try to ensemble the predictions of many different models in some way. And um, like one you know important principle like that we found many times like when we were working on Argon is that actually like, assembling like is a can be used probably like as a better way to do hyperparameter optimization where instead of just taking like a single best model we just combine the models in some way and it can be that like and very often it's the case that the combination of different models uh, like it implicitly like selects the best one but like, that one selects a single model it selects multiple models that all work together uh, well so as a very simple example we can look at like an application of machine learning algorithm to this simple data set, which is the regression problem. So we have two features, like the horizontal axis and the vertical axis, and then to each data point we assign some value, where like dark is a low value uh, and bright color is a, a high value. And you want to build some regression algorithm on this data set. And the simple thing that we can do is we can fit a decision tree algorithm, which would partition the space into these rectangular blocks, where essentially just taking like splits on each of the features. Um, and we may end up with such a decision surface. So essentially, all the points in each of these grids are assigned certain like regression value uh, by this decision tree algorithm. And if we, so this is just one decision tree that we fit. And then maybe if we you know, want to do the HPO or if we train many algorithms, we can end up with many different decision trees. And typical workflow would be with HPO, we just select a single best decision tree that has the best validation score. Uh, but what if we take a different approach and do assembly instead? Then we could actually, you know, do the so-called random forest algorithm, where also each decision tree is like a separate model, um, and then we take the we build the random forest by averaging the predictions of all these individual models. And what you get in the end is something that is not quite like it's in principle better than whatever the best decision tree gave us. So essentially, like no matter how good your HPO was for the decision tree algorithm, it would be better to just do an ensemble and do the random forest. And in the end, it learns a different function. Like it's like it's a broader function class. It can more accurately model the data. And very often in practice, uh, this leads to a better results. Uh, so this was like the you know very good example that many of you are familiar with with like random forest and decision trees. Um, but uh, you know what? What can we learn from it? So the first thing that we can learn is that like it's always better to have like many models and that's how average their predictions rather than having a single model. Um, and also, it can be often the case that um, maybe like models that are individually not so good, after we combine their predictions, they end up with a strong um, performance. Uh, and like, just like this step of averaging the predictions is what brings the um, power to the models. And uh, when doing assembly, we have to focus on finding the best combination of models and not necessarily like finding the same individual models that works well. Um, of course, you know, like this is very simple to example with decision trees, but let's look at like different direction of what, um, you know, like what happens in the real world, maybe not real world, so like a very controlled environments such as machine learning competitions, where the goal is to build um, accurate uh, machine learning models on some, to solve some tasks. Kaggle is one example of such competitions where people uh, publish some data sets and the goal is to build the most accurate predictive model that achieves good scores on some unseen uh, test data. Another like a more early example is the so-called uh, method price that uh, happened, I think, a few decades ago, which was one of these earliest machine learning competitions. And what often happens in these competitions, such as Kaggle or method price, is that people build some really, really complex. So people take this idea of assembling to the limit, and it's not just like a simple ensemble of some simple models. These are some crazy multi-layer, like multi-level models. And um, even like with this original method price, the goal was to predict which movies the person would like. And the goal was to beat the solution of that the ethics team had by 10 percentage points uh, in terms of the accuracy. And like the, the few solutions that managed to get past this bar of being at least 10% better were actually like in the end so complicated. So they all relied on assembly very heavily. Uh, so it's like lots and lots of different algorithms combined together in some complicated ways. But when the engineers, like Matrix engineers, had a look at the solutions, they're like, well, this is. Yes, yeah. if you won the competition, you will get the money because you know this. You, like we promised, if you beat us by more than ten percent, you will, uh, you know, get the money. But we won't kind of really use it in production because the system is so complicated. Like, how are we supposed to implement it and maintain it and deploy it? So it's really, you know, <laughs> some some kind of like it works well, but it's an abomination. And if you look at what wins the Kaggle competitions, these are really some like mon monstrosities where we have 
you know, so you it's like you train many models with many layers with some crazy cross validation techniques where you like hide some data at each level, and then you find best ways to you know combine these models together. Um, like, and it's really like if you look at the like these notebooks or like the scripts that implement it, it's it's a mess. <laughs> so it doesn't look that way. But they achieve very strong results like, by taking this idea of ensembling to the limit and really you know like going like full speed on ensemble. So the question that uh, you know, like the early developers in Hollywood want to ask is like, can we somehow tame these monsters? Can we achieve the results that are similar to what these like crazy ensemble techniques do? Uh, but can we make it like you know usable for the people? Can we actually make it work reliably for different data sets, different tasks? Um, can we make can we automate this process so that the user doesn't need to know anything about like cross validation or like even like <laughs> Even with very little machine learning knowledge, people would still be able to build these performance models. Um, can we train them efficiently and quickly on uh, you know different hardware? And also like the can we also like make them adhere to some constraints that people have? Maybe we can people have some constraints on inference time. So like, you know for a single roll of data, I don't want to spend more than uh, ten milliseconds generating the prediction. How can we ensure that using, using these ensemble uh, crazy ensemble? Mm -hmm. And also, again, just like hide everything behind a very simple API that kind of hides away the complexity from the users. And this is like the um, I don't know, founding principle. <laughs> this was one of our like this is this is the aspiration of the out of the Audible library is to essentially hide all this complexity behind a very simple API and achieve like bring these uh, very performant but uh, com complex solutions to end users uh, wrapped in a simple API and making it very easy. <laughs> Uh, so, what the way Adagon works is under the hood, it trains lots of different models. So, the framework models from scikit-learn, like or ready with the decision trees, like XGBoost, like GDN. Also, some of the more modern techniques. So, if you deal with uh, text or image data, of course, we have to use modern neural networks. So, transformers, pre trained uh, foundation models or images in text uh, that often come from hugging phase or torch image library. And they all wrap together into like this, you know pool of many different models, and then Audible learns to combine these models to get the best possible results from the data set that the user provides. And um, like I said before, the math is... Um, could an ensemble actually have the same model with different data parameters? Like there could be have two likely yeah, yes, exactly. So, so that, that's also possible. <laughs> so it can also, so, so this is like, you know, there is like, there is a default configuration where like, for most people, this is going to be enough. But if you just say, I want to train, I, I'm curious how this, like, I want to do HPO for this model. And I want to like train 10 configurations, 100 configurations for this model. Uh, you can override the defaults and then you can do just that. Yeah, so in principle, that would also work. <clears throat> and this magic component, which actually makes everything work is the multi-layer stack ensemble, something that I already mentioned a few times before, which is essentially this idea of not just training, you know, like, so the way we usually train machine learning models, it would take, maybe let's say we have 10 models that you want to train, linear regression, LightGBM, XGBoost, uh, et cetera, then we train each of these models, and then we can somehow take building an ensemble that they combines their predictions. This would be a one-layer ensemble model where we just have the base models and we combine their predictions together. The multi-layer ensemble model is essentially the idea of, uh, repeating this process multiple times and using the predictions from the previous layer as features. So essentially in the first layer, which is the input here, we first train all these models, like model one through model n. And each of these models generates predictions for the entire training set. And then in the second layer, we concatenate the original features together with the predictions of these models trained in the first layer. And now we essentially have a new feature matrix. Um, and then on that feature matrix, we are training another set of models and these models, essentially, what they can do is they can say, maybe like, okay, if this model, like if model one is confident and model two is confident, then I should really predict this class. Or if it knows, oh, this model usually makes mistakes on this class or these types of data points, and then we can correct for that in the second layer. And essentially, the point is that, uh, like, by this stacking, like doing this multiple in multiple levels, we allow the models on the higher levels to correct the mistakes happening in the previous layer of layers. And this ends up with, with being building stronger models. And all these um, crazy architectures I can show you, uh, like these monsters, they are really following the same principle of just like essentially st doing stacking and training multiple models in different levels and using predictions from the different previous levels as features for the next level. Um, this is the general idea, and this is what Audible tries to automate with a simple API. 
And there's one very important point here is that we cannot just, you know, take the full training set, train all the models on the full training set and like repeat this multiple times, because then what will happen, we will just overfit. So what should really, what we should really do is we should actually use held out predictions from the low level models while creating the model in the next level. And I'll show you in a second what this looks like. So um, the way this is done in practice is using um, cross validation, which is essential. So the idea is we need to have some complete data sets. So you can think of this as the feature matrix and the label matrix um, combined together where each row uh, corresponds to like, a single sample with the features and the labels. And then this original data set, we can split into multiple cross validation folds. So here, for example, for the first fold, we reserve the first fifth fold, the first fifth of the row as the validation set. And then we use all the other rows for training the model. So we have a, essentially, we have a single model for each fold. So the first model trains on these rows and then generates predictions for this validation set. And then we store these predictions separately into uh, like as a separate set of results. And we keep repeating this process for each fold of cross validation. So essentially, if we have five folds, we end up training five models. And each model generates, it trains on all of its training data and generates predictions for the validation set. And then after we have these, uh, these validation predictions, they're also called out of fold predictions. And then essentially, we can concatenate all these out of fold predictions into another matrix. And this again has the same size as the original data set. But now all of these are produced by the like, models that have not seen them. So they're like, essentially they are like, using, they are held out data on which we can use the stack, in, uh, of which, on which we can train the stack or model in the ensemble. Um, so this is how we do the training, uh, essentially by doing this cross validation and generating predictions for each all of the consuming data. Um, and then finally at the test time, after we have all these models, uh, we can just, um, like if we would do this for prediction, we would just, predict on the unseen test set with all these five models, and then just average their predictions, and that would be uh, like the output of the stacker model. So essentially, like each when we say we train a light GBM model, it's not just a single light GBM model, it's actually five versions of light GBM trained on different folds, like cross-validation splits. <clears throat> and we can generate both auto fold predictions necessary for training the ensemble, and we can like at the prediction time, we can get the prediction from this model as the average of these five uh, things in here. And uh, by using these stacker, uh, essentially we get this out of all data, we can train stackers on it. <clears throat> and this is how out of one works. Is it? Like in, in a nutshell, we have some portfolio of models that are like fixed. We have fixed hyperparameters. Um, we train it with multiple layers. And then this is how the whole system works. So like as a short preview of what the results actually look like. So like as, as how you actually use this um, algorithm. And um, all you have to do is just import the tabular predictor from out of one. Then you, here, if, if you have your data in a pandas data frame, then there is one column that you want to predict, which can be class or regression target. Um, and you specify that like my <coughs> column is maybe called class. You create the predictor object, and this is your whole specification on the machine learning task that you want to solve. And um, out of one, yes? Can you display the picture mm, about stacking? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, this one. Um, I have a question. Uh, what's the intermediate uh, prediction? Intermediate prediction. The the second layer. What's the what's the prediction of the second layer? Yeah. Um. I mean, so so essentially the way. Um. I mean, so each of these models. <coughs> um, yeah. And oh, it, oh, oh. Um, it's the. Uh, What's the prediction of the second layer? Is it uh, the signal to the output? It's, 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 exactly. So, so, it's, so essentially, each model that we have in here, both the base models and the like, and the models in the second layer, they just output predictions. They're like of the same shape as your regular predictions. So let's say if you have a regression problem, then they return a single continuous number, which is the prediction uh, like for this data point. Mm, and, um, you, uh, and if you have a classification, they output the probability. Like if it's binary, just like one probability. If it's multi-class, the output like a vector of you know k the probabilities for each of the classes. Um, so the model, like the output, is the same. The input is different because in the first layer, these models take as input all the, only the features. In the second layer, they take as input both the features and the predictions from the previous layer. Uh, so this is what the models do. And like, there's one important component that I didn't mention is this weighted ensemble at the end, where essentially after we train these stacker models in the second level, we can now take a weighted combination of them 
using like the greedy and central selection, which is essentially like we just assign weights that sum up to one uh, to each of them, like to each model we assign some weight that are positive that sum up to one, and this is the final prediction. So we have these separate models here, then we take the weighted average of their predictions, and this is the final prediction of our goal. To add all the, the input to the second layer, yeah. All the features. So. Yes, exactly. So both the original features and predictions of all the model of all the models in the first place. I see. Thank you. <laughs> so there's another question. Ah, sure. First, uh, model one, model two of the model n, the I mean, two layers, but they are not the, the same. Of course, not the same models, but the same architectures of the models for the two layers, or they are different, completely different architectures. Um. So the, in principle, they are like very similar models. Uh, but there are some models that we use in the first layer, but not in the second layer. So, for example, KMN is something you could use in the first layer, but in the second layer, it doesn't make that much sense. But models like YGBM, CatBoost, neural networks, those you use in both layers. They are different implementations. Um, like implementations are actually the same. It's just like the model, not all models that we use in the first layer are used in the second layer, but like the you know the model object is identical. And so the same hyperparameters. exactly the same hyperparameters, same everything. And then the second question, this is a tabular data, right? Yes. Uh, is it the same methodology for time series? Uh, we'll get to that a bit later. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> but but that, that, that's a good point. So like it doesn't work just like that uh, for time series because of the temporal dependency. So we have to do something slightly different. Okay. Any other questions? What is the layer L plus one standard of computer effect? Basic prediction of multiple models and the output of these models. And then again, so in principle, you can repeat this process multiple times. Mm -hmm. So like it's always like the previous, like this, like mm -hmm. in, in each layer, we take original features concatenated with predictions from the previous layer, and this is your new feature matrix for the next layer. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry. Can you define this error or is it predefined? Uh, we'll get. Uh, Good. We'll get to this in a few slides. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, so usually it's like it's two or more, or but usually I don't know automatically based on the time limit that you provide. So let's say if you only say I only have you know, one minute to train, you probably won't have time to do stacking. But if you have, you say, like, I have four hours and I want to use like, the best, the most accurate presets, then it's going to do stacking automatically. So you thought that at the beginning that we recently crossed the but is that kind of like based on how you do it, but it always exists, or we have maybe a couple of different <laughs> or is that actually optimized? So it's actually, so it's actually the, the general thing with automatism is these kind of like reasonable defaults that like, that are not really like, they, that are not necessarily, that there, there might be some heuristics, you know, saying like, if I only have this many features, I will do, you know, something, but it's not optimized on the fly. So it's just, uh, it, it's mostly pretty fixed. I follow up question that uh, some models that require some, like, Specific free processing, you know, some of the good things, like minus the negative values. Yeah. We're not encoding sometimes some of the good things ourselves. Mm -hmm. So you have the different inputs sometimes. Exactly. So, so there's like one like general pre processing step where maybe like daytime features are converted into like month, day, etc. Like, oh, like, and some <laughs> like you feel missing values, you do something else. And then for each individual model, there's additional pre processing step. So maybe like for linear regression, we scale the features for, um, if we have like for XGBoost that doesn't support like categorical embeddings, if we do one hot encoding, and like models that support categorical, we just feed into categoricals. So there's like both a general thing that is mostly shared, and there's like a small pre processing step for each individual model but that, that's also fixed. You, you mentioned uh, with HPO, you would over 50 or whatever data. Mm -hmm. um, and second, there's also this risk that we don't know how to show. I, I'll get to this. is exactly the topic that I'm going to cover in the slides. So we'll get to this. Maybe more questions. Uh, how, how can you determine how many models we should use? Is this something that we can use HPO for also? Um, how many models we should have? Uh, so you have how many layers or how many individual models in each layer? Well, and so, I mean, like, it, add, adding extra models in each layer, it's just, it doesn't really hurt you. Uh, if, you do, if you do validate, like, many enough times, it won't hurt you because if the model doesn't count, you just won't be included in the ensemble and it's going to be ignored by other players. It's just like a trade off of do I want to spend time training this model or is this time better spent, you know, stacking more layers? Um, so it's really just like, it's, 
It's actually there is a default, which is like a reasonable thing that seems to work well, but for a specific problem, it might be that you want to choose a uh, different. Uh, it's also increasing size, right? As uh, much as you put in every Yes. So, can we use some technique to keep the reasonable size while uh, automatically? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there is one thing that we're like there's a constraint on the inference time, which is something that people often care about. And I would say like we want to like have the inference time at most like this many nodes of like milliseconds per row. And in that case, with our long down the it schools like if you see if you train the model and see that its inference time is dual is like is above this threshold, like if you add it to the ensemble, we will cross it, then it's only considered for the ensemble. So that's the way this constraint is enforced. <laughs> Do you use any self-supervised techniques uh, in order to perform marginal reduction? So each extraction needs to be quite mm -hmm. for I think, uh, as far as I'm aware, no. That's not the case. Um, I mean, I think that the principle of the feature engineering, this is one aspect where I definitely, like we also get to this like in a few points, like I think like, out of those, like, not, like basic defaults, but if you do feature engineering yourself, like this is like one very easy way to improve the performance of the system yeah. overall. And so this is definitely can be something, especially if you have high dimensional data. It's more like, I think the, the point of other ones, like it's a reasonable default that works well most of the time, but if you have domain knowledge and if you want to like spend more time actually getting the best results for your, for your specific problem instance, you might be able to beat this, uh, you know, like, with like problem specific things and domain knowledge. So it's uh, like, with feature engineering is exactly this one example where that you could do that, uh, introduce the domain knowledge. I was thinking these four images that are reasonably difficult in terms of self supervised learning. Ah, I, I see what you mean. So, for images, there's like there's a slightly different architecture, and there is mostly based on foundation models. So, we don't feel like there, we just fine tune like some foundation models. And we might get to this, like, um, uh, yeah. So, so, so they're like definitely like this, just this, like the standard tabular thing with the work for sure. They're like these different approaches altogether. Um, okay, so if there are no more questions for now, let's jump to the next uh, point of the presentation. So essentially, the API looks like this. We define the task where we just say this is the column I want to predict, and then out of normal, like, automatically based on the values, can infer which problem time it is, if, if it's a classification or regression or multi class classification. Um, then you call fit. Here you can pass your data either as a finalist data frame or maybe a path to a table file such as CSV or Parquet. And you can select three shots, which is like one way to control how the model works. By default, it's medium quality, which means that like you just like quickly give me some like, quickly get some predictions. And then if you want to spend more time, you can use high quality or best quality presets. And finally, you can provide the time limit, which is like how many seconds you want to wait for the predictor to train. And out of all like, tries to respect it. With a like small rounding errors, but it's uh, like pretty close to the time to specify. And then to get the predictions on the test side, you just call predictor.predict. And here again, you can pass either a data frame or a CSV file and you get the prediction <laughs> as a non fire array or find the series as well. And yeah, so yeah. I have a question with the results because we, it, it was mentioned that when you do extra testing, you can reach over 50, right? Mm -hmm. With the best quality, wouldn't in the same aspect, did in some way reaching over people with the regulation data? Uh, so, so th th this is exactly like, like this is the difference between different presets. Like on the medium code, you just use a single code out set and we don't do any stacking. So it's like really the most basic thing. But then with high quality and best quality, we do actually do stacking and we do not just cross validation one, but we do multiple uh, cross validation like splits. So what I showed you in this figure, it's not just like five folds, but it's like five fold time, times maybe 20. So we do 20 different cross validation splits. And that of course takes much longer to train. So you might do like one hour or several hours. Uh, it really depends on you know like whether you need the best results or you need just to have like, uh, you want to get the results quickly. So, um, and then, so this is the general API. And then like, I want to like highlight some cases, you know, where people compare it to the system with like other algorithms, other systems and show what it's able to do. And as I said, like it's not really like this version is not based on HPO. Uh, it uses the same, absolutely the same configuration, so same code uh, for all the different problems. Um, the hyperparameters are called the default values. And yeah, and we just use the same three line of code without any model specific, you know, input or article. And um, so the first thing that, I, you know, the earliest comparison, this is in the original article on that paper and where it was compared to uh, some other automal systems, both open source and proprietary ones. Uh, using some data sets from the AutoML benchmark and uh, some Kaggle data sets. And um, 
the results were quite promising. And just you know, I want to go over like what these different columns here mean because we will see similar tables <coughs> a few more times uh, in this presentation. So essentially, for each framework, we see how many times does this framework do better than our goal on the data set, how many times it does worse, so achieves a higher loss value, how many failures happened, which is also something that happens to automatic systems. Sometimes you run out of memory and maybe there is like something in the data, maybe there is a bug in the code. So sometimes they just fail and cannot produce a result. Champion is like how many times we got the best possible result among all frameworks. Average rank, lower is better. So what is the average ranking across data sets? And we scaled loss essentially for each data set, we scaled the loss values between zero and one, where zero is the loss of the best model and one is the loss of the worst model for this task. And then we just average for all the data sets. And this is the time how long it took to train the system. So the results were. Is that H2 or dragon? Or is that the time um, of the. Um, I'm not sure. So this is from the 2020, also it's from the 2020 version of the paper. And this is like definitely not the most uh, like authoritative <laughs> version of the results. And I'm, I would have to double check. Uh, I think like there like there is comparison to the US H2 version coming in. And then you probably would be the person to ask <laughs> what exactly happens in the one about the mark. I don't know. Uh, so yes, so now we come to the much more thorough comparison. It was also very recent, it just came out this September, uh, of AutoML benchmark, which is this big uh, open source comparison of different AutoML frameworks on 104 data sets for each data set that include both specification, binary and multi-class regression and, um, and regression. Uh, for each data set, we do 10 folds. So it's not just like a single number, it's 10 tasks for each data set. And we limit the training time to four hours for each automobile framework. And the results for the latest level one version were quite good and it convincingly uh, achieved lower ranks, so more accurate predictions compared to other frameworks, which is already quite a large thing. And uh, yeah, so this, these are the results from the latest version we just came on the archive a few months ago. Uh, of course, you know, Joaquin and Peter <laughs> and other authors. Um, and you can also have a look at like the breakdown of the performance. So it's not just like the other one has an average rank, which you know it could be that you have a better rank, but the performance difference is really tiny. So it's like you know you are by like zero zero point one percent better than like the other models, and you would still have the best possible rank, which is of course good, but doesn't like tell the whole story. And like the other part of the story is like what is the loss of the performance compared to the other systems. And there, like, it's actually like if you look at those numbers, so what is like the change in the loss between other one and other systems, then the difference is actually quite substantial as well. So it's often is like quite a large gap between other one and other systems, um, which is, you know, uh, it's, it's a nice thing like, compared to other other model systems, but it's not like the most, like, it's, it's already like a, it means that for many machine learning applications in the wild, you would get. Pretty good results uh, using Autobahn, but there's like you know this other bar in the name for, which is like candle competitions where you know there are like actual people on every specific task spending I don't know hundreds of hours uh, finding the best possible models to get the best possible results. And the question that we have: Can we actually can we achieve this performance? Like can we beat like the humans who spend a lot of time uh, trying to like squeeze out the best possible results of some systems? So initially, these are some results on tackle competitions where Aragorn didn't com didn't compete live. Um, it was just like after the competition finished, we trained it on the data set, we submitted the results, and tackle tells you what would be your position on the final leaderboard, on the private leaderboard, which means like the actual test set for the competition. And the results here were quite strong, but these were not really like live competitions where we were like, fighting with people. Maybe you know, I don't know, live GBM got better since that competition. So now of course Autobahn benefits from these changes. So it's not really like the strongest possible performance. Um, but what this can tell us is like if we is um, you know if we can like have a look at the one specific competition and like one conclusion we can draw from it is that Autobahn like gets to decent results very quickly and that in itself can be quite valuable. So there is this like Semi like quite a large tempo competition that took place called auto group competition, where there are like 3,500 competing teams, which is quite a large number. Um, and uh, what we have on this plot uh, on the like, right hand side here is performance of each team uh, on, the, on the public leaderboard um, over the time since the competition started. So essentially, it started sometime in the middle of March. And then we see how the scores of each of the top 10 teams got better and better. Uh, as the time of the competition moved on, so when people tried new ideas, people tried new models, new feature engineering and, uh, tricks. And what we can find is that actually out of one in just four hours of training. So if you know if you on day one of the competition you took out of one and trained it on the data set, you would get results that are you know 
pretty close to what the, um, I think the line is a bit off here, sorry. <laughs> so like the, the, the results that are pretty close to what the best humans got in several weeks, or uh, well, actually in two months. So people like the team, people were iterating for two months, getting to the result that is uh, better than, uh, to get a result that is comparable with what other one did on the first, on the very first iteration, which is, um, Quite a nice thing, essentially. Like, if you if you're not if you're okay with not getting the, the very best result, but like a decent enough result, that you know maybe like it would take a few weeks or months to improve upon, then like other goal is also something to try out in that case. Um, and recently, we have also seen some competitions where other goal was able to like was part of this winning or like close to winning solution even in live competitions. So there is one example of this. Um, a housing price prediction data, uh, competition that took place in Kaggle, and there uh, the first place solution was based on Autoclon. It wasn't just vanilla out of the box Autoclon. Uh, so here, this exactly back to the question about feature engineering. So the person said like they it was about geographical data, so they had to come up with some uh, geographical features about like locations and like based on the like, counties and like postcodes, so like, all these additional things. But after they finished the feature engineering, they just Put in the other one, and in the end, you got the winning solution. So it's like you have to like you can focus your time on thinking about the problem setting, and put it in your domain knowledge, and not worrying that much about you know how to build the models, which models to build, how to combine them, which is quite a nice result. And since then, we have seen some other uh, cases with live competitions where people got some high scoring solutions uh, using other one in live competitions. So it seems to be quite like consistently good uh, compared to what people have. Come up with. Okay, so this is like the results after this point. Yes? Do you think these results are achievable with um, good automatic uh, feature engineering systems or what you do? Um, so, so, so this is, you know, this is like, the, I feel like there's the question of like, um, I mean, right now we are at this point where like, we have lots of benchmark data sets. And like, it's also like if you have this hypothesis, it would be quite, like, of course, like you have to come up with how to actually implement it. And, but this would be like a hypothesis you could like verify by just you know, implementing that version and seeing like does it lead to improved performance or not. Um, and so there are some of these methods such as like a KFA that, 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 that allow you to like essentially do like up, up, optimize, like automate the feature engineering process based on the data that you have, also maybe like based on some web data, like names of the columns. Um, and I think combining those with like with other goal or any other automatic system could be like quite a fruitful you know, direction to explore. Um, and yeah, I think that, like just like, based on what you have seen so far, I think this is definitely promising. I would need to like, we need to figure out how to do this actually, you know, like, Based on human input or like based on <laughs> LLMs that tell you how to do feature engineering and some other automated approaches. Uh, but um, I feel like the general is promising, but we'd have to, you know, like actually try this out, try all these different things. And then, you know, like if once you have it implemented, you just like run on the benchmark and it will tell you like with and without. And this is like this would be a, it's hard to implement, but easy to verify or refute if something would work or not. Um, yeah, so now, so what we have seen so far, this is based on the latest, uh, like, stable release of Audible that came out about half a year ago. And now I want to give you, like, a sneak peek of what comes out in the next, in the new version that will come out uh, in a few hours. <laughs> so it was <laughs> supposed to happen, like, uh, yesterday, but we will actually do it uh, today. So, like, maybe, like, after the tutorial, like, in a few hours, you will see the announcement with all these new results. Uh, but essentially, there's a new version coming out, 1.0, which is, like, the first, you know, stable release, or, like, the first, Production ready, like completely production ready, official stable version of other one happening today. Um, and I want to talk about go over two things that uh, are coming in, in this new release for other one tabular and like it, essentially like, as a setup for like, uh, which are like the main components for the new results that we got uh, with this framework. So the first thing is exactly as uh, so Kim pointed out with multi layer stacking, it can actually lead to overtake. If you only do a single level of stacking, then it's fine because then, like at each level, the model you get these out of fold predictions using cross validation, and the models in the second layer um, are trained on the data that was not like like the models like these out of fold predictions they are like actually unseen data by the models during training. But if you repeat this process two or three times, then what happens is like even if you do cross validation in the second layer, the models from the previous like in, sorry if you in the second layer, the models from the previous layer have already seen all the data. In your data set. So this can really lead to overfitting. And this actually happens in practice quite a lot, especially on binary regression and binary classification tasks. Uh, there are like about 33%. So there is this Arduino benchmark, which has like 1,040 tasks in it. Uh, 
381 of those are uh, provided certification tests, if I'm not mistaken. And there, um, maybe it's a slightly different number, but essentially there on all those binary certification tests, actually enabling stacking for more than two layers leads to worse results than not doing stacking for more than two layers. So overfitting is an absolutely real concern and it hurts the performance quite a lot. And so, and that's having to do with this information leak because, you know, if you do cross validation like two times on the same data set, it's not cross validation anymore because you have seen the data previously. Uh, sometimes it still helps when you stack multiple layers, uh, but sometimes it doesn't. And the question that, so it's a real concern, it hurts performance. So the question that we ask is how we can fix it. And based on the work of uh, uh, Leonard Brooker, who interned with us uh, recently, a couple of months back, um, Propose a solution called, that we call dynamic stacking, which is essentially a way to automatically address this question of like should we do should, should we stack for two levels or not, two levels and more or not, um, and the way we do this is essentially you know like now doing like HPO coming back to Autobahn, essentially we do HPO on one parameter but like should we should we stack from all the two layers or not, um, and the way it works is the following: first we split the original data set into two parts. We have the property on the side and a full dot set that we will use for this decision of like whether to stack two levels or not. Um, then we, given the table that we provided, we spend a quarter of it training on the on this proper training set D. Then we do stacking on that. And then we see does stacking lead to like we do stacking as usual. And then we ask the question like does this does this stack model does it overfit on this full dot set or not? So like a very simple heuristic in principle, uh, like does, does it help or not? And if it does help, then we do the retraining again from scratch. We're using the three quarters of the time limit and we're using stacking if it helps. But if we determine that there is overfitting happening when we stack more than two layers, uh, we just disable stacking and then that's it. So uh, it's like very simple, very elegant approach. And we have to answer this question, like would, would stacking overfit for this data set? Because like another one thing, another thing that the planner found out is actually, it's not just like a general statement, like does it always overfit or not? It's really specific, not only for a data set, but even for the splits that you consider uh, with cross validation. So sometimes models overfit, sometimes they don't, but um, there's like, there like no way to know theoretically a priori events, but this is one case where we can just do the standard technique of using a code outset to answer this question. And yeah, this is like one, like seems like a simple idea, but actually ends up leading to very nice performance improvements in the end. And the other thing that we looked into is, you know, again, like HPO, this question that like many of us have had, right? So like in general, like as I mentioned before, like out of the one by people doesn't use HPO, but if you ask, you know, like, is, does it mean that HPO is useless? Useless the answer is definitely not. HPO can help for sure. And like, this is, it's quite important for the models to work, like to do proper HPO. It just like, like one thing that we can draw from this like strong result that Algo has initially is like from without any HPO is that um, if you have a very constrained time budget, you might be better off training like different models and stacking them doing more cross validation than doing HPO. So under a very limited time budget, uh, it might be like you, you might want to prioritize other things. But, like, it's difficult to find like, a good balance between the different um, steps, whether hyperparameter tune or do other things. But if we have unlimited time, then for sure HPO will be able to improve the results. This is like if we combine it with these other techniques like stacking and assembling, etc. So uh, the question that we essentially had is like, is it possible to somehow incorporate this idea of HPO, but still keep all the benefits of other one that we had before with stacking and cross validation? And here's uh, what uh, people came up with. Um, the idea that we have is to essentially do HPO offline, where thanks to, for example, OpenML that has lots of different uh, machine learning data sets, we can, um, for, for different models, we can in principle do uh, train many configurations and then we find which configurations of these models work well on average across a very large and diverse collection of machine learning tasks. Um, um, and um, so essentially, instead of doing like HPO at runtime when um, um, when the user gives the data and like tuning the hyperparameters for this specific data set, what we do instead is we do like HPO offline by essentially finding the best portfolio uh, in an offline step. And then on those hyperparameter tuned presets, we will run um, the standard auto one procedure of stacking and cross validation. Yes? But you don't use the random configuration. But you really create a real HPO, right? Uh, so, so at first, so there are essentially two steps in the process. The first step, like which is this like offline evaluation, what we do is we do lots of random configurations for many models. But why? Why so, random? Um, 
<laughs> what about that part? Why not using it with copy Um, okay. I mean, hmm? okay. so, oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, financial, yeah, <laughs> that's one financial answer. Uh, I mean, I think that like it might be <laughs> that's the way to go. I think that like I really, the, the point is more about like to like explore the space, right? Like and see what works on average. Um, in principle, like maybe like doing something more um, intelligent, like like. Doing like proper HPO could also be helpful there. Mm. I agree. Uh, but like the first step, like in this result, is anyway, is to like you know, we have to run all these configurations before you're able to do like HPO on it. I think it's just also made up for simplicity because it's anyway, like it was quite a massive undertaking. Uh, so let me just like give a high picture of what happens here. So what we do is we take 200 data sets from OpenML. For each data set, we look at three holes, so three random splits or three random seeds for each data set. And then we take six model families. Uh, Getting into decision trees, neural networks, random forests, um, extremely randomized trees from scikit-learn. Uh, for each model, we generate two hundred configurations. Um, uh, Hyperparameter configurations, just random search space. You know, just to example, cover the different parts of the search space, and then we train all these models on all these data sets on all these walls. And what we store is not just the performance of the models, not just the accuracy of each individual model and it's trained in inference time, but also we, we save the validation and test predictions of these models. So essentially this is like every, so this is what, here essentially what we have, this is the, all the information that our one would itself see when starting to do ensemble. So because like all these, essentially we have like a huge collection of these base models that other one would see in the second layer. And because we like, this already would be a really, really large number of artifacts. So you can make like so six hundred tasks in total times six models times two hundred configurations, which it's which is a really really large amount of data. And it's also I think with random search, it's easier to parallelize it probably because you know then you can just like run all of these things in parallel without worrying about it too much. But in principle, there will also be like some way to I think do this better with some other HPO techniques. And then once we have all these um, this huge bank of different results, uh, we can essentially so remember like. What other one does right now, we have 13 models that just have some configurations handpicked by the expert, uh, expert us, you know, it's just uh, educated guess of like, we just have the 13 models, we have parameters and it seems to work. But now we can ask that, now that we have all this information, we can ask the question of uh, like, what would be the best 13 models out of this huge pool of like 1200 different models? What would be the best 13 models out of these uh, to pick that would work well across this huge collection of tasks in open ML. Uh, so essentially it's not just like you know we guessed and it seems to work to like a more principled approach of like what works well on average from this huge collection of good results. Um, I was curious about uh, if you can if you compare your performance with an uh, expert with an expert. Mm. Can an uh, expert uh, construct a um, more accurate uh, model than your so I think like uh, so think about Kaggle competition is like one case where the, this would come to test, right? So essentially like, the, this like the definition of experts or like humans trying to yeah. output the system. And it seems like in some cases Argon is able to like stay on par with them and achieve good results. But of course there are some competitions where you need to have some like very specific domain knowledge where it doesn't really work yet. So I think it's it's really, you know, there is this question of um, I think if your data is very like very well form, if your problem is very well formulated, you have data set that is like clean and reprocessed in like to some degree, it's all in a single table. The features are meaningful, and you don't need to have put in some extra information like you know geographical coordinates or like understanding of maps and streets. And um, then it works well. But if there is this like other component that the expert can bring in about what the features mean and the problem tasks, and knowing that maybe some models are completely bad for this problem class. This would be like one place where experts can out compete. Uh, but it's you know so it doesn't cover the oldest space of machine learning problems, but you know just some fraction of them. Are there any data uh, data features computed about the, the data sets? Um, I mean there are like two hundred things so there's a bunch of information data. Um, so in this case, like there was no like meta learning involvement here. It's really just like essentially like the goal here just like to find the best you know like the best presets to like to like. The same shared thing that is always like fixed, you know, frozen type parameters that we put into the code and we don't adjust it in any way based on the data set. And um, that's essentially the idea. Um, and then, like, using this, this huge collection of computed results, by the way, these results are like most of the papers in archive and like the results themselves are freely available. So, if you want to like, try it out and do some other projects, ask other questions, 
uh, you can also do that. And there are also some other questions that people are asking here. So it's not just for like out of one, finding the best hyperparameters to use among these tasks. It's more just also general questions like what would happen if you train this, this model configuration of this data set. Uh, this, and here we have both like, I think this is not the first time people have done these offline results. Definitely, <laughs> there have been lots of, lots, lots of work in this. I think here the point is more like we are also saving the validation and test and predictions, which take up quite a lot of space. Uh, but that's useful for other ones. So, you know, you know, to like, <laughs> so like look at the like, scope of what was happening here. Like, it's still like it's important for other one, but it's not like the first time people have saved the computer results uh, for these type of benchmarks. And essentially, what we have tried is we um, took a, so we found a portfolio using this algorithm, um, and um, so essentially, like what would be the best thirteen models, like the first the best twenty models to train with other one, um, um, that would actually work achieve the best results on these data sets. And then we compare that to the best. Uh, and then we, what we also do here, we don't just do, um, we don't do any stacking or anything else. We just train these models using this portfolio selection algorithm. And then we just do a simple weighted ensemble. So no stacking, like it's a much simpler version than just other one. And the result that we computed here, and then I'm just like, you know, overfit it to the data set. So we do not like you know, say, you know, like, of course, I know like for this data set, I would maximize the test score if I use these data sets. We do loop one out cross validation. So essentially for each data set, we ask the question, like, given all the other data sets, we find the best portfolio, and then we evaluate that portfolio on this data set. Uh, so essentially, it won't just, you know, overfit on the test score of this data set, we use the test score of all the other data sets, um, and then we, like, apply it to the new unseen data set. So it, like, mitigates the risk of overfitting. And what we found here, which is quite interesting, is that just this portfolio selection method plus simple weighted ensemble works even better than the default out of one version, where we also do multi-level stacking and uh, like, you know, more sophisticated things happening. So essentially just like, so the answer, the first point that we were making, like the defaults that we had before, they were okay, but not perfect, which, you know, we also started from the very beginning. And like, and it's better to use in these more principled approach to find better set of models, better set of hyperparameters uh, that end up working. So like HPO, Works, <laughs> uh, but like in this case, like we, there was a way to like you know do this offline and save time during the actual thing. Uh, yes. And what are the weights? Uh, so the weights for the ensemble, they are learned using the validation. Um, they are learned using the validation set. Essentially, it's, the ensemble it's um, what you have. Like you say, you have ten base models. Then to each model, you assign a weight between zero and one, and these weights have to sum up to one. And you find the best possible weights that maximize the performance on the validation data. So just randomly assign weights and then see what. Like, um, it's not random, but like it's a greedy selection. So you start by saying, like, like you, you start by selecting the model that has the best validation score, and then for each of the models, like if I add this model to the ensemble, how does like which one gives me the biggest improvement in my validation score? So it's more like it's like a you know like it's a um, like you're, you're learning these ways that sum up to one, but it's like this really algorithm which is a stepwise selection. Uh, the paper is called uh, Carana at Alpha, from ICML 2004, I think, uh, which is, uh, yes, yeah, so, like, it's just that algorithm. So there's no, I think there's a like, very little novelty on this front. It's, like, it's, it's called ensemble selection from a portfolio of one, from a collection of models. Uh, for, for the level of stacking. So, you know, so, so essentially, the, the way it's set, like, there are like two levels. Like, the first one, there's one level of stacking, which, is, which will not work it because we do cross validation. Then it's fine. And there's a the question should we do two levels of stacking, like two or three levels of stacking or not? And uh, essentially, out of all, it does stacking until there is time limit, uh, until there is time available. So, the way it works is like with this, you know, like dynamic stacking, we do full stacking with like two or three levels using a um, small subset of the data. We see does it help on the cobalt data or not, and if it helps, then we do the full refit. Uh, we use in multiple levels. If it doesn't help, we limit stacking to a single level. Yeah. Do just the type of multiple level. How do you decide on the level? Uh, I think it's just so. I, I'm, I'm not the right person to ask. <laughs> I, I think that I think it's it's based on the time limit and how much time like is left. So essentially, you keep doing until there's time remaining. Yeah, but if you have larger time limit, you end up with larger level of stacking, and as far as I know, from practice, I still end up with closer. Um. Yeah, I, I would I would have to. I mean, I can try like looking it up uh, like in the code base, <laughs> giving you the answer outline. I don't think I can like say much of that right now. Yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, so there are like different things that could be applied here. To be applied here, so we will see like how what happens when we combine everything in just a few slides. So I think that maybe like, like a very simple explanation that makes sense to me, like when Autobahn had these defaults before, they were just like a, a, a human set them and they seem reasonable, but like there is like very low probability that this is the best thing to do. <laughs> and there is some principled way to answer the question: What is the best set of like preset configurations? Uh, this is maybe you know. Um, and if there's a principled way to answer this question, we'll probably find something that is better than what the human came up with. And the answer here is yes. You know, like of course we are we are not like some oracles that can <laughs> find the best uh, hyperparameter configuration for all models. And like if you do some like, principal procedure, it ends up with a better result. Uh, okay, so we have seen like here, like by just doing this, like essentially this portfolio selection plus. A simple weighted ensemble, we get results better than other one with stacking. But now, like so, in the next release that will come out in a few hours, other one 1.0, we combine these two points, so of this dynamic stacking plus uh, this portfolio selection. But now the portfolio selection is done using like a plus proper stacking for many levels, so it's going to work even better, and and it actually does work even better. Uh, so what we essentially there are also of course lots of other small improvements in here, but I think it's the two major ones for the Tensor model, uh, based on this dynamic stacking and uh, portfolio selection. And this actually again on the Altenau benchmark, um, sweet we achieve seventy five percent win rate against the previous version of Altenau. So like all these technical competitions and like other results we've seen so far, they're based on. Um, um, the previous version and the new version seems to be even better with like quite a nice improvement. And even like looking at each individual uh, Audubon framework, the results are quite strong for Audubon. So it's like 85% or like 80% plus win rate against every individual uh, framework. Um, yeah, and like the results are quite strong. <laughs> so uh, that's, so these most, most of these things really paid off uh, when added to the new version. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, and like the new release is coming out in a few hours. So we could try it out and we'd be curious to hear what you think about it. Um, and another thing, like what we have considered so far, was just the performance, like so the ultimate results, uh, like you know, the, what is the best possible score. But of course, in many applications, it's not just about having the best possible score. You also often have these constraints on the inference time. So let's say you know, if you have some online system, where, like a like, new user comes in, and you have to classify, like is it fraudulent or like not fraudulent user, you want to do some recommendation, or like in all these online settings, you always have some constraint on the inference time, because you can't just wait for, let's say if you, you know, some online advertisement, the user comes to the website, you have to show, the, determine which ad to show them. You cannot just do this like, you know, you cannot wait for five minutes and then show the ad, you have to do this like before the web page loads, loads which can be like a really, really small amount, like, I don't know, a few milliseconds maybe. So you have to put these inference time constraints, um, and what you, this is something you can do with Audible. Mm -hmm. You can also, so with the best quality presets, it's all about the quality. Um, but there are also these high quality presets, which is uh, optimized for the inference time. And you can specify different inference time limits. So here you can say one thousandth of a second per row of data, uh, so like 0 0.005 for per row of data, or even more aggressive. And Audible actually respects these constraints. And what you see is like you can kind of build this like for the front of the inference time, which is on the x-axis. So lower means faster inference, higher means takes more time to predict, to predict a single row of data. And on the y-axis, we have the normalized score for each of these models. And actually, like, all these points that you see on the spirit frontier, they are out of one with different configurations. So essentially, we can get faster results. Uh, and like, so like, it's a, both like respect on the inference time and the quality of the data, it kind of pretty dominates other frameworks and individual and um, machine learning algorithms, which is quite nice. So it's not just about maximizing the quality, it's also relevant for the production of these cases. Um, okay, and with that, uh, we can maybe move on to the like, final doubt for itself. Uh, so you can now open the first notebook that I shared with you. 
uh, which is this idea that everyone, hopefully the installation is finished for everyone <laughs> by now, uh, maybe a long time ago. Uh, so I think you can just try out, try running it, uh, maybe you know, have a look at the results, and I'll walk around the room asking questions. Or we can also maybe like take, if there are some general questions, we can, you know, I, could, I would take, could take them now, and others can start uh, working on the notebooks if you want to. Just a quick one, since you're doing so many modes, is there some way or expecting feature improvements? Which would be quite reliable. Um, so, average or... so it, this is built into the predictor. So, there is a method called dot feature important that tells you what it does some permutation testing uh, on features and tells you the, the importance of the difference. Have you tested all the performance against other feature importance? Uh, I'm not able to answer that question. <laughs> I, I only know it exists, but I'm not sure. Like, it's, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to quantitatively evaluate it uh, against other methods. Okay, so yeah, let's uh, get coding and if you have any questions, just raise your hand and help me. Maybe, uh, can I have a second of attention, please? Uh, hello, everyone. Yeah, sorry for interrupting. So, just like a quick announcement. So, I think, like, in terms of the timing, we're probably like, we already approaching the end of the session, but like, there are still lots of stuff that I want to cover that I won't cover today. So, I just want to like, let's take another one. Like, Couple of minutes, like another minute to like wrap up with the presentations uh, with, the, with the with the hands on, and then uh, I will like say a few final words. They like, quickly jump in over like the things that I also wanted to cover, but won't be able to cover today. All right, does that sound good? Okay, and then of course, if you have any questions, I'm open to them. Like anytime after the tutorial or during the lunch break, I'll be around. So uh, check that out. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So, <laughs> um, you know. We only have like a couple of minutes left, so like just a very like few main points I want to say. What we have seen so far, it's mostly related to tabular machine learning problems, such as regression and classification. But there are also other types of problems that other models support. And like two main classes are multimodal problems and time series uh, problems. Uh, so for multimodal data, this is anything related to text or uh, images, or maybe combinations of both, and maybe even combinations with um, like tabular image and text data all joined together. This is something you can also do using multimodal predictor. And there the essential idea is you combine some pre-trained foundation models that you find tuned plus potentially like maybe like tree-based models like CatBoost and YGBM and they're all again assembled together. And for whatever problem you have, so this is like another type of problems that other models support with the multimodal predictor. And um, fortunately, we can't, can't go over the details now because we're running out of time. This is like one other big set of things, and also like lots of interesting like design choices, like how do you fine tune this file sufficiently, how do you determine which foundation models to use for different tasks. We also have many different uh, task types, such as entity, like matching different entity types, like maybe matching texts and images, doing segmentation, uh, doing like PDF uh, analysis, and etc. Um, and the other set of problems about time series forecasting, and here like, the data itself looks kind of similar to general data, but the only difference is we have an additional column, which is the timestamp of the data, and also like the ID of which time series. So, and because of this like temporal dependency between the data, all these tricks like cross validation and bagging stop working. So you have to get creative and do something else. And they're also like this is also where we have there are many time series specific models like Arima, ETS, DPR uh, that we have in addition to all the temporal models that you can also use here. There are some interesting questions about how to convert the time series problems into tabular regression problems. Uh, there are multiple approaches that you can do for that. And, and of course, like how do you do like ensemble and cross validation, all these questions still remain open. And there are like still, I think, lots of you know interesting challenges to solving here. Also, we usually want to do probabilistic forecasts. So we don't just care about breaking a single value as a regression, but we want to do like one down forecasts where essentially we model the range of all possible values. And there we have the question. So there are these like traditional probabilistic models. There are newer things like informal predictions. How do we adapt that to time series and get good uncertainty estimates with some guarantees? And that we're also looking into. And you know, we also like have recently had a paper on auto long time series and like the general design of the system. And like one thing that I want to point out here is that like there is still it seems like a both. Um, like time series and like multi multimodal, these are the two areas where like not as well explored as tabular data in terms of AltML. And I think there's like lots of low hanging fruit and lots of interesting questions to ask in this space. Uh, so yeah, like if you want to chat about those, I would be very happy to talk about it. Um, yeah, and 
yes, but we're also the hands-on tutorial on time series and also for multimodal. You can find also all the links on the on the website, auto.ruon.ai. And yeah, like if you like another thing that we'll like throw in here, like we also like always looking for interns, both here in Germany and in the US. So if at some point you like wanna, you know, <laughs> if you would be interested, you know, you could like talk to us or like write us an email, we'd be very happy to uh, chat about the opportunities. And yeah, like if you have you know, any questions like about Autoglon or about uh, you know like the um, research ideas that you have that might be related or not related to Autoglon, we also very always very happy and interested to chat, chat about that. And yeah, sorry that I'm like, this guy by the time wasn't able to go through all the topics <laughs> that we have here, but we'll be happy to do that offline. And yeah, thank you for your attention. And